Knowing your blood sugar levels can help you manage your diabetes and lower your risk of serious complications in the future. So today, I'm gonna to answer the most essential questions about blood sugar levels. What are they? Why do you need to test blood sugar? And when and how you can check it? Hey, before we get into all that, you know what? Let me go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Scott. I'm here to help you with all your questions about diabetes. I'm really excited. I hope you are too. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's begin with the basics. What are these blood sugar levels? Well, the amount of glucose in your blood is measured by blood sugar levels, also known as blood glucose levels. Glucose is a type of sugar that's obtained from food and beverages. Blood sugar levels fluctuate throughout the day, but for people with diabetes, these fluctuations are larger and occur more frequently than for people without this condition. Now you might be wondering, why do you need to test your blood sugar? Well, for people with diabetes, a home test helps monitor blood sugar levels. Taking a blood sugar test can help you determine if you need to adjust your diet, your exercise, or your diabetic medications. And this leads to another question. When do you need to check your blood sugar? Well, it basically depends on the type of diabetes you have and your treatment. So if you have type 1 diabetes and you're managing it with insulin, you'll need to monitor your blood sugar before exercising, sleeping, eating a meal or snack, and before certain tasks like driving. Also, you want to check your blood sugar levels if thirst increases and you have the urge to urinate. These could be symptoms of high blood sugar. Your healthcare team may need to modify your treatment plan. Also, you need to check your blood sugar level if you feel these symptoms that you can see on this list. These can be the symptoms of low blood sugar. They can seem to come out of nowhere as your blood sugar decreases. All right, but what if you have type two diabetes? In this case, home testing may be unnecessary if you have a diet and exercise based treatment plan. So how do you test your blood sugar level? I know it might be really stressful checking your blood glucose levels if it's your first time absolutely normal to feel this way. But don't worry, I'm gonna walk you through the process. And once you do it a few times, you'll be able to do it with your eyes closed. So people with diabetes check their blood glucose levels by poking their fingertips by using a blood glucose meter, also known as a glucometer. Okay, so this is how it works. Start by taking the test strip out of the box. But don't forget to close the box afterward because air moisture can ruin the strips and give you the wrong result. Then you're gonna wash your hands with soap and water, and while drying your hands with a towel, you can massage a hand to get blood into the finger. Next step, you want to prick your finger with a small needle, also known as a lancet. To push the blood drop further, you can squeeze the base of your finger. You only need a small drop of blood for the test, so don't worry if you can't get much out. Now, place the drop of blood onto the test strip and then place the test strip onto the meter. The meter is going to do its job and show you the result on the screen. And that's it. All you have to do now is just wait a few seconds and your blood glucose reading will appear. Just remember to dispose of the needle and the strip properly. And wash your hands again, good hygiene. Don't forget to write down the result in your logbook. Very important to keep track of your numbers. And there's some great apps for that now. The one I recommend, the Clino app. It's simply amazing. It offers advanced features to help you take better care of your diabetes. I'm gonna go ahead and put the link to the Clino app in the description below this video. So don't forget to check it out. Okay. So now you might be wondering, do blood glucose levels really fluctuate that much that you need to test them a few times per day? Simple answer, yeah, they do. In fact, depending on what you've been eating or drinking, how active you've been, and even your stress levels, they can fluctuate quite a bit. But eating the right foods, taking your medicine, and exercising can really keep the numbers on track. So if you'll keep checking your blood glucose levels, it'll be easier to spot the food or activities that make them go up or down. If you have diabetes or you've been diagnosed recently, you may notice some unpleasant headaches once in a while. I'm here to talk about what diabetic headaches are, what causes them, and what you can do to avoid them. Hey, by the way, my name is Scott, and I'm here to be your special guide in answering all your questions about diabetes. So, let's get started. Okay, guys, first, you need to know that headaches can be classified as either primary or secondary. Simply put, primary headaches don't relate to any other condition. Good example would be migraines. On the other hand, secondary headaches are caused by other medical conditions or health issues, including diabetes. But here's the main question. What exactly causes those headaches when you have diabetes? Well, they typically develop because of changes in blood sugar levels. A headache can indicate that blood sugar levels are too high, which is called hyperglycemia. Conversely, blood sugar levels may be too low, which is called hypoglycemia. We'll talk about that more in a minute, so keep watching. 
People with a recent diagnosis, they may experience headaches more often, and that's because they're still trying to manage their blood sugar levels and find a regimen that works for them. People with diabetes who manage their condition well and keep their blood sugar levels under control, well, they're less likely to experience headaches. So if your diabetes is uncontrolled and the fluctuations in blood glucose levels are high, you're likely to have headaches more often. Hey, before we continue, don't forget to subscribe to the Clino channel so you don't miss out on future diabetes management videos. Also, check the link below this video for a 60 second quiz to evaluate your diabetes health state. All right, so I briefly mentioned hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. Now I wanna explore this more deeply since it's really important for people with diabetes. So let's start with hyperglycemia, which as I mentioned, is the medical term for high blood sugar levels or too much glucose circulating in the blood. However, other symptoms of hyperglycemia that you can see on this list are often slow to appear, and they don't usually occur until glucose is above 200 milligrams per deciliter. While we're on the topic of headaches, they can take several days to develop, and they're considered an early sign of hyperglycemia. The pain can become more severe as your condition worsens. Okay, so what should you do if you have headaches caused by hyperglycemia? Well, first of all, realize that hyperglycemia is a serious condition that requires rapid management because high glucose levels can damage the blood vessels and nerves. Hyperglycemia can be managed in just a few steps. Number one, make lifestyle changes that include a healthy diet and exercise. Two, check blood sugar levels regularly. And finally, take medications if prescribed by your doctor. Keep in mind that when your blood sugar is controlled, you'll likely find that you have fewer headaches. Okay, now let's talk about hypoglycemia, the medical term for low blood sugar levels. Hypoglycemia is defined as having blood sugar levels below 70 milligrams per deciliter. It can occur in people with diabetes if they take too much insulin or they don't eat enough carbs. This too is a serious condition since glucose is the primary source of fuel for many cells in the body, including those in the brain. Headaches in such cases are usually accompanied by other symptoms of hypoglycemia that you can see on this list. The symptoms here are typically sudden and may seem to come out of nowhere as your blood sugar decreases. Now you may be asking, how do you treat headaches caused by low blood sugar? Well, the first step in treating this kind of headache is to confirm that the pain is occurring due to low blood glucose. So here you need to take a blood glucose test. And if it verifies the issue, you need to head to the next step. Eat 15 grams of carbs or glucose tablets to raise blood glucose. And then check your sugar again in 15 minutes. If it's still below 70, well, have another serving. Once blood sugar returns to the target range, the headache should subside. Also try to make notes about such episodes and talk with your doctor about why it happened. Health professionals can suggest the most effective ways to avoid low blood glucose in the future. Okay, I've dropped loads of information here. So if you have any questions about diabetes and headaches, leave a comment below this video and I'll answer ASAP. And listen, you have to remember, it's essential to control blood glucose levels and practice effective diabetes management. And always consult a doctor before making changes to your diet, your physical activity regimen, or medication. Why is blood sugar important? And why should you care? Well, it actually affects how we feel throughout the day. Unhealthy blood sugar levels can wear us down and frankly, everyone around us. Headaches, low energy, rapid weight loss, mood swings. These things negatively impact your quality of life. Hello everyone, I'm Scott and in this video, I'll tell you exactly what your ideal blood sugar levels are, how to tell if you have high or low blood sugar, and the best ways to manage each of these conditions. So, what are blood sugar levels? Well, blood sugar levels, or glycemia, are simply the concentration of glucose in your blood. From waking up until the time we go to bed, our blood glucose starts at its lowest and begins to rise after we have our first meal. Healthy blood sugar levels are not an exact number, more like a spectrum. If your blood glucose swings too much beyond either side of the spectrum, well, this manifests in your body in the form of symptoms. For example, Low blood sugar levels, or hypoglycemia, can be dangerous if left unchecked. Here's what symptoms you might experience when your blood glucose drops too much out of the healthy range. Dizziness. Glucose is your brain's main fuel. When you have low blood sugar levels, fatigue sets in, and it can cause you to feel tired, weak, and yes, dizzy. Shakiness. Low glucose levels disrupt your central nervous system. To help restore them, the body starts to release adrenaline and cortisol. As a result, these hormones may cause your hands and other body parts to shake or tremble. Loss of consciousness. When your blood sugar gets really low, your cognition takes a toll. It may cause you to slur your speech or start being forgetful. And in some extreme cases, it can lead to a seizure or even a coma. Okay, now shifting gears, there are also various signs when your blood sugar levels are, are too high. 
Here's what you might experience when your glucose levels rise beyond the healthy range. Urinating more. It's your body's way of eliminating unwanted stuff from the body. By making you visit the bathroom more often, you know, it'll try to flush out the excess blood sugar. Drinking more water. When you flush out that extra blood sugar, your body needs more water to make energy, transfer nutrients, get rid of waste. It makes you really thirsty as a result. Blurry vision. In this attempt to use all the fluid to flush out unwanted sugar, your body doesn't make an exception for your eyes. It draws out fluid from the retinas and can damage the vessels behind your eyes, which may even lead to blindness. Dry skin. When the body extracts body fluids to fight excess glucose, it also draws it from your skin. It's one of the most common early signs of prediabetes. All right, so now you may be wondering, well, what's a healthy blood sugar level then? Well, like with many things when it comes to our complex human body, the answer is, it depends. More specifically, it depends on two things, your age and the time you test your blood glucose levels. Generally speaking, an optimal blood sugar level in the morning before eating for anyone, regardless of age, well, it should be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. But guessing's not enough. It's important to know the exact ideal ranges. And here you can see the ideal ranges based on your age and your testing time. Take a screenshot of it and save it for the future. I'm sure you'll need it. And while you're doing this, hit that subscribe button on the Clino channel. More videos are yet to come. Okay, now that you know what your ideal blood sugar levels are, I'll give you some effective tips on how to keep them that way. So let's start on how to prevent hypoglycemia. If your blood sugar levels are consistently dropping below the healthy range, then it's likely you have hypoglycemia. To bring them back up, here are the actions you should take next. Number one, get it diagnosed. This can be done with at-home blood test kits. However, a better option would be visiting your doctor. You'll get more detailed results along with a consultation. Number two, ramp up the healthy carbs. Most people think low sugar is an excuse to indulge in candy bars and chocolate but you should save those for emergencies, like when your blood glucose goes below 55 milligrams per deciliter. To prevent the roller coaster of blood sugar swings, go for fruits, veggies, and complex carbs. Number three, take blood sugar regulation meds the right way. People who have high blood sugar levels may take their blood glucose levels dangerously low with their medications, so make sure to only take your medications at the right time and together with the right drugs. So now, what are the best ways to prevent hyperglycemia? Well, number one is to move more. Exercise lowers your blood sugar in a couple of ways. In the short term, it enables your cells to take up extra glucose and use it as fuel. It also increases insulin sensitivity so your muscles can better take advantage of any available insulin. And in the long term, exercise can help permanently lower your A1C levels. Number two, take a test. There are different tests people with high blood sugar levels can take. These include an oral glucose tolerance test, and a fasting blood sugar test. It's best to consult a doctor to find out which one is right for you. Number three, take insulin at the appropriate time. Insulin is the best way to fight hyperglycemia if you've been diagnosed with diabetes. However, if you stray away from your doctor's dosage recommendations, it can make your blood sugar levels dangerously low. Well, as you can see, abnormal blood sugar levels can pose a serious health risk if left unchecked. But I hope that after today's video, you understand what your ideal blood sugar levels are and what you should do when they get too low or too high. Now it's up to you to maintain them in the healthy range. Hey there, Scott again. And today I wanna to talk about the myths of type two diabetes. This condition is surrounded by various misconceptions that may even sound absurd. For example, that diabetes is contagious or that people with this condition are dangerous drivers. Now, of course, both myths aren't true, but what are some of the other most common diabetes myths? Let's do some fact checking today. So here we go. Myth number one, eating too much sugar causes type two diabetes. Now I can agree that it may seem like an easy target when talking about diabetes, but I'm gonna be honest here. Sugar itself isn't the culprit. Some other risk of developing type two diabetes are weight gain, increased body fat, heredity, and inactivity. So it's basically a variety of issues that causes the condition. Now it's true that you gain weight when you take in more calories than your body needs and sugary foods and drinks contain loads of calories, but it's more important to match your calorie intake to your body's needs, not just cutting sugar out completely. 
However, if you notice that sugar in particular is making you put on weight, then you're increasing your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Now myth number two, type 2 diabetes only affects people who are overweight. As I mentioned before, being overweight or obese is a serious risk factor but it's also possible to have this ailment without having weight problems. In fact, around 10 to 15% of adults with type 2 diabetes, they aren't overweight at all. This shows that other risk factors, such as family history of diabetes, physical activity, high blood pressure, ethnicity, and age, well, they also play a role. All right, before heading to some of the other most common diabetes myths, make sure to subscribe to the Clino channel. We make complicated topics about diabetes simple, so don't miss any of our videos. We have several more still to come. Okay, now let's move forward to myth number three. Type two diabetes isn't a serious condition. Well, unfortunately, it is a serious chronic disease. And according to the American Diabetes Association, this condition causes more deaths every year than breast cancer and AIDS combined. Also, diabetes nearly doubles your chance of having a heart attack. Furthermore, all types of diabetes can have various effects on your body, such as kidney disease, eye problems, high blood pressure, tooth and gum problems, skin problems, sexual dysfunction, and so on. All right, I don't wanna sound like a complete pessimist here. I just want you to be aware of the possible complications that may arise when you have diabetes. On a more positive note, if you manage your diabetes by making lifestyle changes and by carefully listening to your doctor's recommendations, you can highly reduce your risk for those serious complications. Okay, myth number four. People with diabetes can't eat carbs. Believe me, there are plenty of diabetes patients that eat carbs and they're doing perfectly fine. And it's only because they're doing it the right way. Everyone needs some carb containing foods in their diet. And for people with diabetes, the quality of the carbs is more important to their health than the amount they eat. So if you're eating the correct carbs and combining them with healthy fats and proteins, along with exercising and managing your weight, you'll be able to handle your diabetes without going totally carb free. So again, you need to understand that it's not just a food problem or just a fat problem, it's an array of several different factors. And finally, myth number five, people with diabetes need to eat special foods. Well, come on, diabetes management doesn't work like that. It's a total misconception. Diabetic people can eat just like people without diabetes as long as they consume healthy and whole foods. So you definitely don't have to go and spend a bunch of money on so-called diabetic foods. First of all, if the label says diabetic, low sugar or no sugar, then the price suddenly goes up, sometimes by double. Secondly, foods with special diabetes friendly claims may still raise blood sugar levels. But if you still wanna try these out, then read food labels carefully. And as I said before, a healthy meal plan for people with diabetes is generally the same as healthy eating for anyone. So you basically need to include lots of non-starchy vegetables, limit added sugars, swap refined grains for whole grains, cut out processed foods as much as possible, and prioritize whole foods over junk food. Is your blood sugar acting up? Are you looking for natural ways to get it down fast? Okay, I know you may be rolling your eyes at common sense advice like limiting your carb intake, portioning your food, and checking your blood sugar more often. So, if you'd like to go beyond the basics and really take control of your blood sugar spikes, then you're gonna enjoy these five little known tips for taming blood glucose. You may have heard of or may even be doing some of them already, but give each of them a try for yourself and feel the difference. Let's begin with number one on our list. Take a walk after meals. One of the first things your doctor will prescribe after your diagnosis is to move more. And that's for good reason. Study after study shows that exercise makes your body more sensitive to insulin, helping you control blood sugar more easily. And what's the perfect low impact type of exercise that almost anyone can do? Well, walking, of course. It also provides the ideal minimal effective dose of movement to curb post mill spikes. According to a 2013 study, taking three 15 minute post mill walks improved glycemic control and eliminated blood sugar spikes. The study also showed that splitting your time throughout the day was even more effective than taking a single 45 minute walk in the morning. So you can drop the marathon walking and take a more relaxed stroll after a meal. And as an added bonus, this will stimulate your metabolism to digest food faster and help eliminate bloating. Now, tip number two, feed your gut bacteria. Soluble fiber, also known as prebiotics, is the food the good bacteria in your gut munches on to survive. It also pays you back with lowered blood glucose levels. 
and fewer sugar spikes. The ideal daily fiber consumption is around 25 grams for women, 35 for men. It works out to around 14 grams per thousand calories. Now, what are some good sources of soluble fiber? Well, while most fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes have some soluble fiber, the richest sources are black beans, Brussels sprouts, sweet potatoes, figs, oats, peas, beans, apples, citrus fruits, carrots, barley, and psyllium husk supplements. Probiotics are also never a bad idea. Ingesting new strains of good bacteria is proven to lower fasting blood sugar, glycated hemoglobin, and insulin resistance in people with type 2 diabetes. There's one caveat with probiotics though. It is critical to take them consistently so they can survive in your gut. So try to include kefir, kombucha, sauerkraut, and kimchi in your diet, or consider taking a good probiotic supplement. Tip number three on today's list, try glutamine. Glutamine is an alpha amino acid used in the biosynthesis of proteins in the human body. According to research, type two diabetics have considerably less glutamine circulating in the bodies. Recent studies show that it amplifies the blood sugar lowering role of insulin and it helps your body release more of it as well. Glutamine also has a potent anti-inflammatory effect on your insulin producing beta cells, shielding them from free radical damage. Good sources of L-glutamine include chicken, fish, cabbage, spinach, dairy, tofu, lentils, and beans. Glutamine is also available in powder form and may be a great addition to your supplement regimen. All right, tip number four, keep your cool. Stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol directly affect your glucose regulating hormones. When your body enters the fight or flight mode, known as the typical stress response, your nerve cells fire to send blood to the muscles and limbs. At the same time, the liver releases excess glucose as fuel to fight off the threat. Sadly, people with diabetes often have trouble dealing with this influx of blood sugar. That's why taking care of your mental health is essential in managing your blood sugar levels. So try mindfulness, journaling, exercise, or my personal favorite, spending more time in nature, which almost immediately lowers cortisol levels in your body. And finally, tip number five, try apple cider vinegar. Recent studies now show that apple cider vinegar has become a cure-all panacea for almost anything. Weight loss, improving skin conditions, and gut healing. But now, there's also a handful of human studies that show there are blood sugar lowering benefits to this common kitchen item. When taken with a high carb meal, it may improve insulin sensitivity by a whopping 19 to 34%. The takeaway here is to try to have ACV in as many meals as possible. So put it in your salads, your soups, sauces, or simply drink one to two tablespoons of ACV diluted with water. Remember, you don't want to take any shots of apple cider vinegar straight from the bottle. Because of vinegar's acidic compounds, it should always be mixed. Otherwise, you risk side effects like tooth enamel erosion or drug interactions. So there you have it, five science-backed lifestyle changes to naturally lower your blood glucose. Keep in mind that none of the tips you learned today are a substitute for proper medication treatment and a diabetes-friendly diet. Think of these tips as going the extra mile to get even better control over your daily blood sugar fluctuations. Okay, this video is a must watch. And the reason why it's so important is because we're gonna talk about what prediabetes is, and more importantly, how to reverse it. You may have watched other videos that included much of the same information, but I wanted to make just one that explains everything you need to know. Okay, so prediabetes is a condition where blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not high enough yet to be diagnosed with type two diabetes. Your doctor may also refer to this condition as impaired fasting glucose, or impaired glucose tolerance. It's diagnosed by taking a blood test sample. What separates the diagnosis of diabetes and prediabetes is blood sugar levels. In prediabetes, your blood sugar is from 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter. A number higher than 126 indicates that you have diabetes. So what are the symptoms of prediabetes? Well, you can have prediabetes for years but have no clear symptoms. However, if you've already been diagnosed with prediabetes, it's important to consult your doctor if you experience any of these symptoms. You ready? Increased urination, especially at night. Increased thirst. Sudden weight loss. Feeling more tired than usual. And finally, cuts and wounds taking longer to heal. These are symptoms that are typical for type 2 diabetes, and they may indicate that your prediabetes has progressed to type 2 diabetes. Okay. 
so there are no symptoms for you to understand if you have prediabetes. While anyone can develop it, there are several factors that will increase your risk of developing this condition. It's really important to talk to your doctor about getting your blood sugar tested if you have any of the following risk factors for prediabetes. You're overweight and your BMI is over 25. You're 45 years or older. You're physically inactive. You have more fat around the waist than the hips. You can measure this risk factor by checking if your waist is 40 or more inches if you're male and 35 inches or more if you're female. You're African American, Asian American, Hispanic, or Native American. I know it may be surprising for you, but race and ethnicity play an important role in developing prediabetes and diabetes. Continuing, you have a family history of type 2 diabetes. You smoke cigarettes. You have certain conditions such as gestational diabetes, polycystic ovary syndrome, high cholesterol levels, or high blood pressure. Okay, even if you're at risk or have already been diagnosed with prediabetes, it doesn't mean you'll definitely develop type 2 diabetes. And before prediabetes develops into type 2 diabetes, it can absolutely be reversed. I want to help you a bit here, so I'm going to give you four main tips on how to reverse prediabetes. So let's see what we got. You ready? Here we go. Tip number one, manage your weight. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, losing just 5-7% to of your body weight if you're overweight can significantly reduce your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. For example, a 200 pound person who loses 10 to 14 pounds could already see a significant health improvement. Also, always keep in touch with your healthcare team. It'll not only help you develop a strategy and health plan that'll work for you, but they'll always support you along the way. Tip number two, make small eating changes step by step. There's no one special diet for all people at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Everyone's an individual, so there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. However, your blood sugar level is directly affected by the things you eat. Carbs and sugary foods, well, they raise blood sugar more than vegetables and proteins do. What you should do here is eat more fiber-rich foods, such as fruits, non-starchy vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and legumes. And limit your intake of sweets and sugary beverages, including soda, sweet tea, and sports drinks. Instead, drink pure water or add some lemon to it. Try carbonated water if it's too hard to make the switch from soda. Furthermore, don't skip meals. Skipping meals often leads to binge eating later in the day or night. Instead of going without a meal, try eating smaller meals more often throughout the day. Tip number three, set a simple exercise routine. We all hear it online or on TV and we know it's necessary to exercise and that's because physical activity can reduce your risk of developing many chronic illnesses. Regular exercise is also one of your most powerful tools for reversing prediabetes. You should aim for at least 150 minutes of physical activity per week. And I know that 150 minutes may sound like a lot, but you don't have to do it all at once. It could be 30 minutes a day, five days a week. I recommend doing an aerobic activity that includes brisk walking, riding a bike, or swimming. And if 30 minutes a day seems overwhelming, well, start small and work your way up. For example, you can do a 10 minute walk during your lunch break or follow along with a short online workout video. Believe me, it's still better than no exercise at all. Finally, tip number four, try out the Clino app. Clino was designed to help people manage prediabetes and diabetes. The app offers a personalized meal plan, grocery list to make your shopping easier, no equipment workouts, and a detailed progress tracker. That's all you need, right? I'll put the link in the description down below this video so don't forget to check it out. In this video, we'll discuss some uncomfortable truths about men living with diabetes. Now, a little warning, what you're about to hear is a sensitive topic for a lot of men, but it may also motivate you to get your blood sugar under control if you have diabetes. So let's see how diabetes affects men, what the complications are, and how to avoid all of the negative fallout. First, Let's start with the physical symptoms from blurred vision, increased thirst and hunger, going to the bathroom more often, and feeling tired for the better part of the day. It's taxing to say the least. And mentally, you have blood glucose at the back of your mind all the time while never being able to let go and try new foods without wondering about their carb content. It's a huge mental load. But 
As some male diabetes patients know, the problems also extend to the bedroom since they may have erectile dysfunction caused by the condition. Here's a staggering statistic that may shock you. According to a 2017 comprehensive review of 145 studies, more than 50% of men with diabetes have some form of erectile dysfunction. That's half of all male diabetes patients. Now keep in mind that this is just the cases with an actual diagnosis of diabetes. That number may be even higher once you take undiagnosed cases into account. So how does diabetes lead to erectile dysfunction? This is your autonomic nervous system, or ANS for short. It's also called a vegetative nervous system since it controls a myriad of unconscious processes in the body. One of them is regulating when your blood vessels widen or constrict. Diabetes damages the nerves and blood vessels in the male reproductive organ. And when this happens, it often results in problems achieving an erection. However, diabetes doesn't just stop here, it also stunts fertility and motility. This is because glucose metabolism is important for spermatogenesis or the body's ability to create male reproductive cells. Diabetes affects their quality, motility, and DNA integrity. The condition may also be passed down to future generations, which increases the risk of developing diabetes in your offspring. The effect of diabetes on male fertility has been documented in many studies, including one that showed 16% of the participants had primary infertility. Now let's examine another factor, stress. In a large Swedish study by the University of Gothenburg, starting from the 1970s, researchers studied 7,500 men born between 1915 and 1925, and after 35 years, they followed up with them to find out if long-term stress raised the likelihood of diabetes. The men who reported permanent stress in their work or private life had a whopping 45% higher risk of developing diabetes. And this is why lowering stress is a good strategy to push back against symptoms of diabetes, as this 2018 study shows. But another thing I want to talk about is how diabetes originates differently in men and women. While it shouldn't come as a surprise that men tend to store more fat in the abdominal region, while women store it in their glutes and their upper legs. But research now shows diabetes depends on where that extra fat goes. This is because diabetes is closely connected with abdominal fat. You see, women store fat just under the skin, which is known as subcutaneous fat, and their fat cells tend to multiply and increase in number. However, Men mostly store extra fat around the organs, which is known as visceral fat, and their fat cells expand and get bigger. This puts them at higher risk of disease. A large 2016 study of over 480,000 patients showed that men with type 2 diabetes had a 9 centimeter wider waist than men who didn't have the disease. They also had a 3 point higher BMI. Thanks to having more hidden visceral fat around the organs, men who don't appear to be overweight or obese could also be at risk. The takeaway here? Well, losing weight is one of the best ways to fight diabetes. All right, so here comes the main question. What should you do to avoid all these diabetes complications? Well, first, you need to take better control of your blood glucose levels. And secondly, if you're carrying excess fat around the abdomen, your next step is quite obvious, to lose that extra weight. Beyond standard advice like proper medication treatment and a low sugar diet, there's also merit to doing resistance-based exercise. Higher muscle mass leads to improved insulin sensitivity and blood glucose control. If you take all of these initial steps, I'm sure you'll manage to keep your diabetes and your overall health on track. For other science-based tips, have a look at the other videos on our channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.